This is the AH-64 Apache. The newest model of the AH-64Es are now about to enter service with the Army Air Corps, following the new procurement of 50 airframes from Boeing. And it might be time to talk about the procurement, as the Apache is the backbone of NATO's rotorcraft close support, being operated by five member states and 19 international partners, and often being rated as the best attack helicopter in modern military service. But if you look at all of the variants of the Apache, you will notice a strange outlier. The WH-64, or in British service, the Apache AH-1. With a different radar, engines, fuel tanks and rotor blades, it was a licensed produced variant of the Apache made for the British military. Manufactured by Boeing in its Mesa plant in Arizona, it would then be shipped to the UK for final construction by the Italian firm Augusta Westland, out of their plant in Yeovil, Somerset. All normal, right? It happens all the time. But if we go back to the procurement in the 1990s, we stumble across a story many in the Ministry of Defence would rather be forgotten. A story of political favours, insider trading and backdoor deals. They would unleash a number of headaches for the AAC going forward. So it's 1993, and seeing some limitations with the newly developed Lynx A7s, the MOD would put out a request. They're looking for a new attack helicopter with a focus on ground attack, and the procurement process would begin. Now, there were five competitors for this bid, but only two were taken seriously. The Eurocopter and the Apache. Just to run down the others. The Super Cobra was in need of modernisation, the Comanche is a fever dream, and the Munguska is shit. So with the trash taken care of, they could get to proper evaluations. And the two aircraft were close, but the fact the Apache had been combat tested, apparently won over the AAC. Or so they told the press. And this is where the stupidity rose its head. Now to understand why military procurement contracts are normally very expensive, you need to stop thinking that politicians are just dumb. The way most politicians see this level of expenditure is normally in job creation and economic growth. Two vote-winning buzzwords that they're going to need to stay in power. Now, if they procured the Apache, it would be made in America by Boeing. The Mesa plant employs 4,800 people and has around 600 subcontractors. And with £4.1 billion being spent, that's a lot of money going towards American jobs. And those jobs could be British. So Boeing has allegedly told the AH-1 would have to be licence-built in the UK by one of their competitors, in this case Augusta Westlands. You know, the people that made the Munguska. Now, the choice of Westlands is strange because they were already producing the Lynx and the Gazelle, so why not go with Airbus or BAE? Well, the government at the time was conservative, and Yeovil, or the constituency around it, though it's Lib Dem. So it's a seat the Tories thought they could win if the jobs were sent in their direction. But if that was the extent of the corruption, everyone would get on with their day. And this is where the story gets a little more dangerous. All of the subsystems for the AH-1 would also be built in the US, something the government couldn't stand for the same reasons. So they used the same trick and allegedly pressured Augusta into modifying the AH-1 to fit British-made components. The one that caused the most controversy was the engines. These were the TRM 332s. Now, from declassified engine statistics, these were the most powerful engines ever fitted to any model of the Apache. So, by conventional wisdom, they would also be the best strike. Right? But with all that power came two major downsides. They ran significantly hotter than the General Electric T700s, which in the high temperature and low pressure environment of Afghanistan, where the AH horns would see most of their service, made them very temperamental something the Americans noted when operating alongside the UK. The second problem is the lifespan of critical turbine components with less than half that of GEs. Both of these led to longer maintenance periods more often, with less availability of spare parts and no ability for foreign maintainers to work on the airframes. This fact was made worse when they had to ship the helicopter back to the UK from Afghanistan in order to do a majority of this maintenance. From all of these downsides and all of the additional costs that went into maintaining the fleet, you would hope that this was the reason why the H-64E's procurement stuck with them being made in the US to the same standards as the US aircraft. But unfortunately we find ourselves living in a world called reality, which sucks. So when the UK was going through the purchasing of the, the new Apaches, the Tories' 1994 gamble would pay off. So in 2015, Marcus Fish would become the MP for Yeovil. 
And with the Navy eyeing the new Lynx Wildcat, they didn't see any need for the airframes to be made in the UK anymore. And for Rolls-Royce, well, they didn't make the RMT-332s anymore. That staple of British technology had been sold to the French company Saffron. And with Tories having no appetite to buy French-made equipment, and no constituency they desperately needed to win over from the Lib Dems or Labour, the AH-64Es were bought into UK service as direct purchases. You'd have hoped this had been a cautionary tale about letting politics decide procurement. So, let me introduce Ajax, an IFE that worked well in Spanish and Austrian service, that competed against a CB-90 which is better. And the Ajax won the bid because it would be made in the UK by General Dynamics UK in... in Wales. So, Ajax procurement started in 2009, and that's a labour seat. This is the bit that most of the public miss when it comes to the conversation around defence spending. Yes, defence contractors make a lot of money, and yes, the military-industrial complex is scary. But the reason why it continues has a lot less to do with politicians making loads of money, and more with them wanting to keep their jobs. Because all they care about is staying in power. And this is what defence contractors actually take advantage of. But this has been a politic chalkboard video. If you've enjoyed, consider giving it a like, maybe even subscribe. Do come back for more.